I'm Lexi and this is Hannah and we're Wild About Conservation. This is the podcast where we explore the world of conservation through discussions with our very knowledgeable guests. And this season's focus is on all things ocean. Welcome to our first episode. Today's pod is all about us, Hannah and Lexi, your co-hosts of Wild About Conservation. We take this time to explore how we got to where we are, how Wild About Conservation came to be and where we hope this project goes. We promise a season full of fabulous guests, but keep listening today to get to know us a little better. We hope you can take something away from this episode, whether that's an insight into just how chatty we can be or how so many different routes lead right back to conservation. We hope you enjoy listening to this podcast and please remember to leave us a review. Get in touch on our Twitter and if you would like to support us as creators, we do have a Patreon. You can check out all of the links in the show notes on our website. So enjoy. So Lexi, who are you? That's a pretty big question. Um, My name's Lexi. I go by she, her. Thank you very much. And I am currently a volunteer coordinator for the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland. Do you care to tell us a bit about yourself, Hannah? I do. Um, I am also she, her. My name is Hannah. I have a lot of names, actually. Hannah Zoe Laurie Lee, but we won't go into that. I am a PhD student at Current. I am in third, almost fourth year of my PhD in Edinburgh. And I research blue carbon and oysters, which is the carbon that is stored in our oceans. And also science communicator and one of your two podcast hosts. So I think we're going to start off our podcast with some fun, quick fire questions. Um, Lex, do you want to take the first one? Sure. So the plan is to ask our guests these questions and put them on the spot a little bit. We thought it would only be fair if we got involved ourselves. So I'm just going to pick a random one from the list to ask Hannah. That's really mean. (laughs) (laughs) So Hannah, if you could be any animal, what would it be? I would be, for some reason, straight away. Oh my God, I would be a mantis shrimp. (laughs) Sure, we can get on board with that. (laughs) It's just like things, I mean, most people find them beautiful but terrifying, which I feel like is a great thing to be. Um, when they whack things, it makes speed of sound and all that and loud noises and they can crack shells open just by punching it, um, which is a pretty hefty skill to have. But yeah, being like beautiful and terrifying at the same time, I feel like that is something I am well up for embodying. Um, so I'm not going to ask you the same question because that would be too easy because you've been sat there thinking about it. Um, my favourite one of our icebreakers is, would you rather be a dung beetle a mayfly or a cockroach? Right. I know it's <laughs> quick fire. So I'm quickly going to say cockroach. But I'm definitely gr- regretting that decision already because I don't know if I want to ever survive an apocalypse because this pandemic has done enough to my survival mode. But I'm going to stick with cockroach. That's another really good thing we should mention is that we are recording remotely uh, because we are recording during the pandemic and the first part of 2021 um day 7231 of the pandemic but we're going to bring you some ocean love to help with that um but yeah i can see cockroach as well i mean get your head chopped off keep running around and get squished and still survive they're pretty good life skills (laughs) my theme tune would be i get knocked down i get back up again (laughs) feeling pretty cockroachy right now in the best way (laughs) right hannah if you could live in any habitat which habitat would that be? And if you choose something oceany, you have to go a bit more specific. So I preempted that you'd say that to me. Um, not the like ocean, no, like the go specific. So I would say ocean, but maybe like a mangrove or something kind of coastal, subtidal, intertidal. So intertidal being between the bit that gets exposed when the sea's low, but that's a pretty cool place to be, but it can also be a bit terrifying. But if you lived in a rock pool, there's just all sorts of funky things going on in there and you never know who your next visitor might be the next day there might be a fish that comes to say hi and then leaves when the tide goes out at the same time living in a rock pool can get very hot while the water gets warmed up by the sun so maybe that isn't really where I want to live but quick fire that is my first and only answer or absolutely terrifying as kids come along and poke you with nets 
in the right season. I did also think about that as I was saying it, yeah. <laughs> but not... exploring our rock pools respectively is very, very... Respectively? Respectfully? Anyway, respectfully, that's the word I'm looking for. Again. Um, <laughs> it's a very good thing that everyone should try and get involved with safely and respectfully. Um, so, final. If you could fly, breathe underwater or hibernate, what would it be? I would absolutely choose breathe underwater. 100%. I have already done a bit of a stint of free, di- free diving in one of my internships and I loved it. And it was so frustrating that I couldn't get better in the very short time that I was trying my stint at free diving. So breathe underwater. I like the idea of breathing underwater. I'm not sure I could rock the gills. I think I could. <laughs> Just one real hefty scarf in winter and then all, all year round. Yeah, that's true. I'm getting like flashbacks from like the boys yeah, episodes Yeah, now. me too. It's <laughs> just like, where would your gills I mean, be? in my mind, they're on my neck, but that's just because, you know, we use this entire system yeah, to Yeah, so breathe. that was what I thought. So too. it would be like constant snoods and turtlenecks. I'd just look really, really sophisticated all the time until I got underwater. Then I'd look sick because I'd just be able to breathe and not be worrying. Oh, it'd be great. Do you think you'd have webbed feet as well? Well, I mean, we can get fins and flippers and stuff, so it wouldn't be as much as a necessity. Whereas, like, having to actually think about, like, diving equipment and do all the checks and the oxygen, getting the oxygen and stuff. Like, imagine if you could just get in the water and just keep going. Yeah, absolutely, breathe underwater. 100%. I feel like that would be the dream. And also, I mean, so there we go. Something else I can add to who I am. I dive as part of my research um and a commercial diver and diving in a dry suit in scotland it's a pretty hefty task uh getting everything on and off and yeah doing all of those checks so yeah if you have if you have gills that would be great and rocking turtlenecks i'm fine with that i love turtlenecks. i love being so warm let's I do like it that idea. right so this is not <laughs> just a quick fire podcast episode it is also getting to know myself and hannah a little bit more i think Me and Hannah know each other pretty well by now. We've been friends for a few years. We met through a mutual friend um, and then we both happened to be in Edinburgh and just wouldn't leave each other alone. But I probably don't know the answer to this question, Hannah. What is everything that you have ever been in your life? Everything I have ever been. There is a list. People say, do not work with animals and children. I have done both. Not at the same time. Actually, that's a lie. I have done it at the same time. (laughs) That was fun. Um, so I my probably my first job was actually as a play barn kids host. Um <laughs> it's great for communication skills, I can say that much. Fair enough. Um, but yeah, like kids play barn and you do every job under the sun from making food and coffees to corralling children while you're trying to clear things up. Uh, I hosted kids birthday parties I'm very good at singing happy birthday very loudly um, which if you're not really getting the gist me and Lexi we do chat a lot which is why we have decided to start a podcast and we are both conservationists um, and love conservation so that is the birth of this podcast but yeah my first my first job was a children's host for parties after that I've been a music teacher I've worked in the kennels I've helped with riding lessons which is where the kids and animals come in so corralling horses and children (laughs) no thank you I mean it sounds like a fun challenge though I mean you get to stroke horses so that's fine with me (laughs) just cuddle horses for most of the day and get kids on them most of the day so yeah it's not quite working with children and animals in the same sense if you're not got the animal in the kids play barn but it does still tick that box I think barista That's something I've done for a solid period of time. And both Lexi and I are slightly obsessed with coffee. If you're ever a barista from the age of late teen forward, I think that will begin any coffee addiction for anybody. Because that's how it happened to me and Hannah. So just get a job as a barista, get some people and communication skills and get serious about coffee. (laughs) That's what you need in life. We are renaming the podcast to Wild About Coffee Vation. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, that's a good shout. I actually have a friend who is a, or has been a barista and she hates coffee. She absolutely hates coffee. So it could go the other way. But yeah, no, what you just said about like the communication skills and the people skills, like definitely 
talking to loads of different people, walks of life, it really has helped massively with communication skills and being able to communicate clearly and not just make great coffee or what I think is great coffee. <laughs> I enjoy it. <laughs> coffee is an opinion. Co- coffee is an opinion. Yeah. And then I've also been an outdoor instructor. I've worked in Lapland. That was something I did um, with children again. <laughs> and yeah, I was an outdoor instructor for a while working in the Welsh countryside and all weathers. And then I moved to Scotland and I started my PhD. So all along in that time, I have also been doing university education where I've studied marine biology and marine science and done a few trips abroad, uh, working for various conservation charities. It's just all sorts. I have been so many things, which has given me so many different experiences that I can use in different ways and reflect on and friends and all of these kind of things. But yeah, Lexi and I actually met through one of the friends that I went overseas with on to work on turtle conservation. So myself and this friend, we were working in Mexico with a charity called Operation Wallacea. And we were working on two separate turtle projects. I was working with turtles at night, looking at their nesting habits while she was working in the day. And her and Lexi have been friends forever. And then Lex moved to Edinburgh. And there we go. That is where the our story starts and definitely took off at high speed <laughs> basically cue every romantic comedy you've ever watched <laughs> but with just us put me and hannah in it in the center of edinburgh trying to find one another pretending that we know that we're not going to get on immediately because we're both chatty and we both love this mutual friend and being a little bit nervous about it but it, it's a blossoming relationship and has been ever since <laughs> that is a beautiful way to put it like i love it thanks so that is that is I mean that was like a whirlwind visitation of many jobs as just a list as long as my arm and Lexi you have also been many things in your life as we all have I have no idea what you're talking about I've only ever been Lexi just (laughs) that's it no stories here no all I all I want to do when I listen back to your like life bio thus far in your 20 something years is just ask you about everything (laughs) But I need to stop myself because I know a lot of it. But also, I imagine we'll have a fair few people that are quite interested in what we've done a little bit more specifically. So, yeah, let's have a think. What did I do? I have worked firstly in restaurants, bars, cafes, pubs, hostessing, serving, customer servicing, living my best life, learning to love coffee and deal with issues as they come up with people and there is still now a very small small part of my heart that adores all of that kind of hospitality and service industry and if somebody were to put me back in it now I would literally dive deep and adore it because there is something really really wholesome and really really grounding about working in a cafe and you tend to meet some amazing people in that situation then when I was at university I became a student ambassador and that was probably one of the funnest jobs that I've ever done because you're just thrown together with students and you get to showcase your university and your course to prospective students and parents and I'm not gonna lie this is where my dad jokes well and truly started and where (laughs) I learned to become punny for the first time so yeah love doing the student ambassador job at the same time I also worked in IT Um, for the university so very very hot on customer service there and because of my love of IT I then also volunteered for the student radio and had my own radio show and that's where Hannah and I have slowly and surely eked our confidence further and further through our knowledge of conservation technology and radio and decided that yes yes if we were going to do a podcast we absolutely should do a podcast but after talking about this for probably about six months, no, maybe maybe a year now, time has gone weirdly in the I, pandemic. Time has disappeared during the pandemic, as I'm sure many people feel. But no, it was definitely a conversation. And then I think we'd both been thinking about it anyway. And then we realised yeah. we were on the same page and it was like, done deal. That's it. Lexi and Hannah, let's brainstorm 500 names for a podcast. <laughs> And we settled on what about conservation because fundamentally that is what we are. But we are having to do this remotely, which was not in the plan. But I think we're so excited to get this out and ready and up there that we were just like, right, we've got the equipment. Let's just go for it. What else have I done? 
I worked for IT at a second university when I was doing my master's. I also volunteered for the South Wales Wildlife Trust as a student committee member. That was really, really insightful, um, really, really good for some event management and communication skills, especially when dealing with conflicts and knowing that conflict isn't a bad thing. From there, I did two volunteer coordination internships and then was lucky enough to secure my job at the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland as a volunteer coordinator, which means I basically get to look after all of the programmes that are run for the volunteers between Edinburgh Zoo and the Highland Wildlife Park. So a lot of what I do is coming up with really, really fun public engagement communication tools and feeding that through the volunteers. So it's a lot about recruiting, training, capacity building and having a bunch of fun whilst being surrounded by people that really want to be there and animals. It's not so bad. Sounds like a pretty, well, I, I think your job, job does sound pretty dreamy anyway. But yeah, it certainly and add to that, like outside in the Scottish weather as well, <laughs> which yes. can be very changeable. Just picking up, obviously, we've both done masters. Mine was just in straight marine biology. Remind me, Lex, what your masters was in and kind of the research project that you probably did with that as we do a year the masters in the UK. Yeah, so my undergrad was geography. BSc because geography is like one of the only degrees where you can choose either BA or BSc and I decided to gear that completely towards the physical and ecological side of it because that's what just interested me more and that's where I really got that human wildlife conflict ecology kind of interest in my brain so then when I came out of um, my first degree as a geographer I was like well I don't want to be a geographer I want to be an environmentalist or a conservationist I want to be a little bit more. I started looking at what masters I could do and I settled on one in Swansea University and it was environmental biology, resource management and conservation. So it is an absolute mouthful to say and pop (laughs) on a CV but it does what it says on the tin and it gave me so many more skills than I had before and really increased my confidence. My master's thesis was on the effect of light pollution on the bat population around Swansea University. So I recruited a lot of friends to come on night walks with me over that summer. That sounds like a dream. Like, what was your master's thesis in? Shells. So I realise now, um, obviously, as we're talking as well, that I have touched on the fact that my PhD that I'm currently doing, so I've got till the end of this year uh, left, so end of 2021. And that's working on blue carbon, as I mentioned, is the carbon stored in our oceans by wetlands, but also by other habitats and oysters so bivalve shellfish shells that have got two sides to them and there's a little creature living on the inside and Lexi is making a little clap sound that it does make me wish we had video with some of <laughs> some of our podcasting so my thesis for my master's so as I mentioned my master's was marine biology I studied at Bangor University in North Wales so I lived in Wales for about four years which is also how I ended up being an outdoor instructor I saw a job post one day and was like that looks fun it was amazing. I was a zipline instructor for nearly four years and I went through every weather in one day because that's what Wales is like. And speaking to crowds, that's definitely where I got a lot of my confidence working that job. Speaking to people from different backgrounds, different cultures that had like traveled far and wide to come and do our experience and doing that for a couple of years and also training other staff as well. So that gave me a real insight to supporting other people which I feel is a skill that I draw upon readily in my everyday life and within our team and within other people that I work with and then yeah I decided to stay on for a master's and do a master's in marine biology and my master's thesis itself was about certain shellfish that comes from Uruguay and how it was affected when it grew by low oxygen which is also known as hypoxia So basically looking at were there changes in the shape of the shell or potentially if you were to cut the shell open, could you see changes in the structure of the shell? In the same way that if you cut a tree open, you see tree rings, you see something very similar in shells, which is called scleroconology. So the study is scleroconology and it's looking at the hard parts of animals. But yeah, when you said earlier, the the can and the mouthful of your name of your master's degree, Lexi, It's also just a mouthful of a master's. They're very full on, but I absolutely adored my year as a master's. And I adore my years as a PhD as well, but it it is pretty full on all the time. 
and just doing all sorts of things which is great because you get a taster for lots and lots of different things yeah I absolutely think staying in education was the best thing I could have done up until my master's point just because it gave me the opportunity not only to do the education side of things but to learn more skills in different jobs that I d- didn't necessarily want to stay in but definitely enjoyed doing at the time and then gave me the extra opportunity to volunteer in different things to figure out exactly what part of conservation I wanted to work in so I adore people I adore training I adore public engagement so I really think I'm in the right place in terms of where I am now so one of the jobs I didn't mention that I did for a little while when I came back from my internships was working as a bat surveyor and that was so much fun I adore the groundwork of ecology I adore the surveys but I didn't so much enjoy the reports of it it was very much a two-sided job in that aspect Um, and being able to work for three four months as a like junior surveyor for a small ecological firm really proved to me that I enjoyed real real small aspects of something but I know it's not the right thing for me so I think having the time in university really gave me the scope to narrow down where I think I I could see myself Hmm. and actually drawing on that you've mentioned a few times about the different internships and I think we've both been conservation volunteers as well as maybe helping volunteers get where they need to go so kind of where where have you been we briefly mentioned obviously uh, my involvement with Operation Wallacea but yeah where where have you been what have you done what kind of projects what skills all of this kind of stuff (laughs) yeah so the first thing I ever did um so our mutual friend the first voluntourism kind of if you want to call it that that we ever did we went to Greece together to Kefalonia and um volunteered on a sea turtle project for two weeks and we both absolutely got the book and that's what made both of us kind of go down the ecological route of our university career then I was immensely jealous of um our friends our mutual friends going to Mexico and being able to work with Operation Wallacea and working with these incredible people and getting to meet more people but I couldn't afford to be out of the country at the time of um dissertation collection so I saved up all my pennies and worked another job as well as what I already did and did a month-long volunteer trip to South Africa and helped out at a wildlife sanctuary slash game reserve and that was so wonderful and I learned so much about um the poaching situation and about what they're actually trying to do with canned lion hunting and a lot of the issues surrounding that and then when I finished my master's I was really really lucky to secure an internship with Atoll Volunteers um, and Atoll Marine Centre in the Maldives which is a local NGO and I have never met more hardworking people in my life and it's ran by some community members and then mainly most of the work is done by three or four interns at a time that kind of stay anywhere between three and six months and that's where I really got the bug for volunteer coordination and realized that it could be a job that I could get paid for in the future but I was able to run all of the projects that I do around um, sea turtle rehabilitation coral reef restoration looking at um clownfish and whether or not we could have a look at those populations and just map them to see where they are and if they need help which they definitely do as well as some community involvement programs so we did a program with the hospital we did a sports program as well and we also ran a nature club for the local schools i regularly am in touch with some of the guys that i met there and oh i'd do it again in a heartbeat if i could And then I went out to Malaysia for a couple of weeks for my final internship. And I don't often talk about this one with friends because it, I came back early. I came back after two, three weeks um, because I I secured the internship before my previous one was over and I was really excited about it. And I thought it was definitely going to be more of the exact same or very similar because the internship in the Maldives was um, marine and coastal and definitely not necessarily what I was comfortable with but definitely interested and I found so much wonder and awe there so I applied for a rainforest kind of focus 
role when I went to Malaysia and I got there and the role was not as advertised what I was expected to do was completely different than what I was told the people that were involved were it was a completely upside down situation and I came home early it took me a long long time in my own mind to not see that as a failure but I will admit for a very short while I was not entirely myself because I thought that I should have been able to stick it out but many many a phone call to a few friends and my parents made me realize that I could come home and find some other things and I came home and got the job at the zoo so I'm a big believer of what is meant for you won't pass you by but also if something comes up like just try it I think that's a really great point um picking up on a few things you've just mentioned there is that not every opportunity like for some we've been quite both quite lucky to travel and do conservation overseas yeah. but it has come at I mean, I have regularly at some points worked three jobs while also doing a degree to be able to do that. And we both have very, very well planned out diaries to be able to do all of these kind of things and still find time for ourselves and friends and family and everything else. But it's also that not every potential opportunity is somewhere you need to stay. And I think that's a really clear, and important message to spread as well in general is that it is okay sometimes to go and do something else if something isn't working out for your own health as well. I think that's that's a really important thing. Yeah, and it's something that I probably should talk about more, but I think I thought it was a good thing to mention on here, just in case anybody needed to hear no, it. I completely agree. And yeah, so I've um I've done all sorts of UK based volunteering as well as overseas. Uh, from a young age I've volunteered for different uh, charities actually so I helped fundraise for RSPCA for a long time and also Children's Hospice which was in the north of England and helping fundraise for them just running small stores or charities markets things like this and then I went to I picked my sixth form which is like so that's when you're this is where I get all the ages wrong 16 to 18 I think yeah yeah 16 to 18 and I stayed on and I actually chose my sixth form based on the fact there was this one trip that I could do and I went and did it and that was going to Mexico and I worked yeah I I went to school and the rest of the time I worked to get all this money together to take this trip and I remember coming back actually on the way back we were all at the airport and I'd like eaten snacks that we'd got from the paid part of the trip and everyone was like oh I'm gonna go spend my final money and I had like three pounds (laughs) and everyone was eating Domino's pizza and I was like looking I was like that puppy that looks longingly like I really want Domino's pizza but I have no pennies left (laughs) so I didn't eat I didn't need it and we were about to get on a plane where there was food for us but I have a really distinct memory of that of like right down to my last penny to be able to have these opportunities and I have been in that kind of scenario quite a few times (laughs) going to do stuff and like trying to support just like getting these experiences um but I wouldn't change that in a heartbeat and I've been very lucky as well to be able to do things like that. So, yeah, I went to Mexico. I did a week in the jungle while I was out there. And so we learned some trapping skills and like herpetology. So the study of reptiles and amphibians and kind of how they collect those uh, samples and how they take measurements. Habitat surveys. So a habitat survey being where you look at the trees, what kind of trees are present, what density of trees are present in the forest, small mammal tracking large mammal tracking because there was um, jaguars in the area (laughs) so not scary at all I would love there was actually I think it was there um I don't know if it's after we left or a few years later but there was reports of like cubs and like a female being seen in the area where we were like that's awesome and you're going and visiting like local temples yeah like you kind of like I want to see it but also I don't um and crocodiles as well there's crocs there which when you're not that far from the tent you're like this is terrifying but also really exciting at the same time and then I went to the coast for a week and that's where I learned to dive and that was amazing and I have been diving since um and now I dive for work as well my first diving experience I remember putting my head under the water and when you learn to dive you have to remove your mask and my mask got caught in my hair and I like freaked out. And even to this day, I have to admit, and I don't think it's anyone's favorite skill of like having to flood your dive mask and then take it off and all of this. Everyone hates it. Um, and I, I've got a commercial dive license and 
I would like I'm fine with it but I there is still that little historical twinge that goes in my brain like I don't like this <laughs> so that was like I remember that first experience I think it's like well, it's normal <laughs> it's human yeah um and yeah and then I fell in love with diving I went and saw turtles nesting for the first time which you can you can kind of get involved in those kind of experiences there are some ways to get it that are quite expensive but you can do it relatively cheaply because a lot of these charities just need manpower so but again like I said both of us have worked several jobs at the same time as well to cover other fees like your living costs your flights and things like that but I was lucky enough that that opened the door for me to be able to do a few more trips with the same organization at very little cost and off I went I went to Indonesia and went to the rainforest uh, which was stunning I want to go back to a rainforest and live in a wood hut and do bat surveys every night I have a real thing for being nocturnal when I'm on survey but not in real life I like sleep very much it's good I like sleep just sleep sleep in the sleep in the middle of the day if you need to yeah but that's the thing and that comes back to like the balancing of things when I was in Mexico the second time so that's when I went out to do my dissertation actually we were sharing a room with people that were working during the day such as our friend that we've mentioned because she was working on the turtles in the bay that are there during the day and looking at interactions with tourism so in that bay actually there's a big problem with people touching turtles because they they're residents there and kind of how do you police that how often does it happen how does that change their feeding behavior and these are all the really important interesting things that are being done there by the research teams and this is another uh, non-governmental organization so another ngo called SEA, which is the Centro de Ecologico Acomal, based there. So it's basically the center for science in the village. And they also run the night surveys, which look at the nesting population and the hatchlings to so the baby turtles and how light affects them, how many come to the beach every night. And they monitor that year on year. They've got decades of data. So they're really great people to work with. And it was just really exciting, really fun. But we were sharing our dorms with people who were up in the day. So we'd kind of get in at like 5 a.m. And obviously they'd get up a couple of hours later. So we had a rule. So we could only sleep till like midday and then we'd have to get up because you can't expect everyone else to wander around in the dark. So that in itself was a bit challenging at times. And when you're in a dorm full of 10 girls and you've got a few of you saying, turn that light out. <laughs> Sometimes you've got, you need some yeah. diplomacy there or to just uh, get out of everyone's space a little bit to <laughs> not get grumpy with each other. That makes sense. But yeah it's been really fun doing those kind of things and I feel like all of that experience has given me lots of different insight to working with different people and working in different places and working with volunteers working as a volunteer and then I did my master's did stay in the UK the whole time work-wise and master's wise and then that's when after I finished my master's this is the job I didn't mention I went and worked at a pizza place <laughs> I moved home, a Penningula student. I mean, and yeah, I worked in a pizza shop. Yeah, so as a conservationist, a conservationist is something you are, not something that you always do, I think is something that you have to learn. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, I tried to get anything. My issue was I was very much a Penningula student and moving home, there's only landlocked in the middle of the UK uh, in the Peak District. There's only so many kind of conservation jobs at that time that were marine that I could probably get to. And also, I was just trying to rebuild myself after spending all of my money on a master's degree. So I went and worked in a pizza shop. But then I got a barista job. So that made me very happy. And as Lexi said, that always, always will hold a special place in my heart, uh, the hospitality industry. I have so much respect for everyone um, that works in hospitality and the bar scene, the coffee scene. And it's just fun. Like, I used to love people watching. Just <laughs> all kinds, of, like soap opera. It's literally like you're in a little soap opera. And yeah, so but for a few, for about two weeks, I did work at a pizza place. And I, it just wasn't for me. <laughs> but I stayed there because I needed the work and I needed a job. Then thankfully, I got another job. And then I'd also, in this time, been in Finland. As I mentioned, I worked in Lapland for a season as like a seasonal instructor kind of job and I'd seen the PhD that I'm currently doing and applied for it and then I got invited to interview and the same day Yay! I got offered the role and then that's been the last three years of my life and that in itself like there is 
bits of kind of I don't know if I quite call it volunteering but definitely the added extras to generally what is my core role so doing public engagement so going out and going to science festivals and doing education doing lots of talks doing teaching working with students doing my own research and then dive surveys as a diver Scotland has some amazing dive sites it is just a little bit cold and I can see Lexi like cringing you may have noticed from my internships and abroady things, I go to where the sunshine is because I don't handle the cold well. And how I ended up in Edinburgh, can't tell you. I mean, I can. It was for a job. But Hannah, the fact that you're just there like, yeah, I've been in Finland. Oh, no. Mm-mm. <laughs> no, and actually, yeah, you're like, I go where the sun is. I'm like, I just go where the sea is. If there's sea, you could probably tempt me there. Just give me a bit of ocean and you're probably... <laughs> probably tempt me into your ocean land (laughs) but yeah like lots of different things and yeah my PhD focuses on looking at oysters and how they draw carbon down to their environment and how they also release carbon and I'm also associated with the restoration project working to restore the native oyster which was abundant around the coastlines of the UK and fished out well over 100 years ago and there's lots of these projects now all across Europe working for the same common goal of restoring a habitat and you might think of it the same as like planting a tree but instead you're planting an oyster and this is actually the decade this year is the decade of restoration has begun so super excited for that because it, I'm really like what's going to happen over the next few years I think will be cool. I have a question. Yes. Is it technically rewilding because it's with live oysters or is it restoring because it's with habitat? I like the distinction there. That's the first time I've heard it said like that of like, because as we see, it's a habitat. So it's restoring a habitat because you talk about tree restoration rather than potentially rewilding. But Mm -hmm. you're definitely bringing the wild back. You're bringing something that's native back into the ecosystem or habitat that it was lost. So the thing with an oyster, they are a pillar of a habitat because they build a habitat. So they're reef builders in that they build these big reefs. Um, And it may be that the reefs are patchy, but this is all kind of the research that's ongoing is what does a reef or an oyster bed look like? Therefore, they're building a habitat, but they themselves as a unit, they're an animal that's being put back. So... That's a really good question. And actually, <laughs> your brain is like, I would say now it's rewilding, but it's still restoring. <laughs> I know it's like it's both. I think I've definitely yeah. like rewilding is something that I've heard used. And I can definitely see how we can use rewilding because at the end of the day is putting back a native animal that was once not there, such as the beaver programs, uh, which I think are really exciting. I know what I'd do if I walked down like a woodland path and saw a beaver. So all over the UK at the moment. When we can drive, we should absolutely go out to Napdale and just see if we can find some beaver signs, which I've been told all about them from some of the conservation team in RZSS. So I just really want to go and have a have a have a have a few long walks in the woods. And that's exactly it. That's that's I think that's the most exciting thing of Napdale is one of the sites that you can go out and there is beaver restoration or rewilding happening. Yeah, because you don't say beaver restoration. It's a great point. Um, there is rewilding of beavers happening, but also down south of the UK. Um, and there's all these different sites and beavers themselves, they do engineer the environment around them. So they are potentially engineering an environment because of the way they build dams, they fell trees, they change the ecology of the area. But I think it's super exciting, all of these. And like another project that's going on is the red squirrels, uh, rewilding with red squirrels and red squirrel breeding. Um, one that you can probably talk about, Lex, is actually the wildcats of Scotland. Yeah, so we are we have been involved, our ZSS have been involved for a long time of just monitoring the wildcats in Scotland because they are elusive animals. I will tell you that for nothing. They do not like to be seen. They do not like to be heard. They are sneaky as can be. However, we have technology and camera traps really help us out with this situation. But we've recently been granted some money. Um, to build a um, breeding centre up in the Highlands so we can breed some wildcats and raise them so that they can be released 
for um, a reintroduction program and rewilding program, which is really, really exciting. And we've been funded for five years, which is a really long time. And then the building is being built with other mammals in mind so that hopefully in the future, if we get wildcats to a point where they are less endangered, then we can focus our efforts on breeding to release some other species. What is a wildcat? Scottish wildcats and European wildcats are only different geographically. So they're not a subspecies of one another. I could go into cultural conservation for ages, but the reason that we still call them Scottish wildcats is because the cultural heritage means that if Scotland feels an ownership over an animal, it will care more to save it, much like um, with the red squirrel. We don't necessarily need to save the red, red squirrel because the grey squirrel is a much better squirrel at being a squirrel. But we care about the red squirrel because we've heard about them in stories all of our lives growing up and stuff. Same with the Scottish wildcat. If we started just renaming it constantly, the European wildcat, it would lose that sense of importance. So when you're looking at conservation issues and conservation problems, to be able to make something that little bit more human really, really helps when it comes to getting volunteers on board, getting funders on board, getting stakeholders on board and being able to create a project, whether that's rewilding, protection, even just like getting people aware and spreading some sort of message, having some sort of cultural connection is really, really important. And yeah, if you don't know what a wildcat is, you should Google it because they're super cute either way. But yeah, as you said, the kind of the biggest risk to them is that inbreeding. But that's a really great point about ownership of a species or why we care about what we care about. Why do we get wild about conservation? Why do we care about what we care about? For us, we care about conservation. But on the deepest human level, there is a relevance of conserving our natural habitat, either for cultural values or for own reasoning, be it coastal protection. Uh, So your salt marshes, your mangroves, these coastal habitats provide excellent coastal protection. Or other species such just kind of all sorts of different reasons why we might care about conservation. And I think that's so important to mention is the human aspect. At the end of the day, we share the planet with all of these animals and with these kind of conservation topics um, to put, to sum it up really quickly and therefore making that human aspect known and also taking into account the choices and what's important to a stakeholder, which is a person who has that role involving that environment and has interest in it is so important when it comes yeah, to conservation. Yeah, so as much as we mentioned earlier between our own separate little spiels, diplomacy and human and people skills and just being able to talk to other people super duper important but no Hannah you made me think of a really interesting question um what was the thing that first got you interested in conservation whether that is something really really small as a child and it's just grown from there or you know one of your trips abroad Mm, that's a great question straight away in my head my head goes David Attenborough um (laughs) which is so true for our generation yeah, just we're just going to now gush about David Attenborough instead. What an amazing man, as we all know. But for me, the ocean, it definitely cast its spell when I learned to swim. <laughs> um, I was seven. Actually, I've been learning to swim before that in a pool, but not doing very well. I was seven and I learned to swim overseas. And then I learned to swim in a pool, but I could only swim underwater <laughs> for some reason. I could not like there was there was there was no getting me to swim on the surface. So I was constantly underwater for hours. And then I started snorkeling, got introduced to what a snorkel is. And my mum could not get me out the sea. Like it would be one of those where I'd go in. I'd be like, look at this underwater world. Isn't it amazing? And then she'd be like, Hannah, get out. Puts a T-shirt on me like you're burning. You're dark because I'm quite tanned naturally. But like you're getting really tanned, like just you're going to burn. I don't want you to burn. And then it would be like a scenario. Of she turns around us for a second and hands us back in a sea. And that was it. It's like the sea had cast its spell. I love the ocean. And actually on the point of snorkeling, just because snorkeling tends to get associated with being warm and overseas, and Lexi's going to cringe at this, snorkeling in UK waters <laughs> is amazing. Like the opportunity of seeing the underwater world of British coastlines. If you think about what you see, if you've ever been to a rock pool, and if you haven't been to a rock pool, the next time even if you're just in a woodland like lift a log 
see what's under it. If you're in a rock pool, have a sneaky peek at the seaweed. My first UK dive, I got excited by seaweed. Like, that's how excited I was. I was like, that's cool. There is seaweed everywhere. And that was really cool. And snorkeling, you can go and do that without having all that hefty dive gear. But you do still need maybe a wetsuit to keep you warm. I was going to say, I would absolutely go snorkeling in the UK on a couple of conditions. One of those is at least a wetsuit or the right climate. I'm just not happy being cold. I know myself. It's one of my boundaries. Give me warm. No, that is very, very true, though. Is And that is actually a really important thing. But if you are getting in the sea in the UK, there are the things you have to take into account because at the end of the day, you are a mammal who loses heat through water and staying warm and making sure you have hot cups of tea, not going in the sea if it's rough. They're all really, really important. And plenty of jumpers when you get out. I actually wild swim, so I swim at one of our local beaches. And that is like the, one of the most important things is it's just knowing knowing when you're still welcome in the sea and when you're getting cold, when it's time to get out, when it's definitely not time to go in, such as when Beast from the East 2 is arriving and all of this kind of thing. So yeah, you can kind of get an idea of our timeline right here with uh, some of some of what's going on and what we're talking about. But yeah, no, it's a, both are a beautiful place. And I mean, Cornwall needs to get down there and get some snorkeling because that is a little bit warmer, which is why it's a surface haven as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah, on that topic, what is one of your favourite things about conservation? I'd say that topic. Our entire topic is, is conservation. <laughs> Our entire conservation conversation. So cheesy. But my favourite topic and favourite thing about conservation is definitely, is actually the human aspect and getting, conservation comes under so many terms. Like what is conservation? What do people consider conservation to be? And I'm sure there is probably a, like an actual defined term I know there is because I work in science there will be but from the thought of it can be many things to different people the conservation to me starts with education and you cannot expect people to care about the planet around them go out for a walk and actually look at what's in the trees unless you share your passion and your love and that is one of my favorite things about conservation is talking to people about their passion and their love of the things they work with or work on because everyone with different jobs it's not just conservation if you get someone talking about a thing they love they get really passionate but when it comes to conservation get them really passionate share that passion and you create change for other people and it might be a change to not use a water bottle it might be a decision about what you got for lunch that day or it might just be thinking about the kind of reusable plastics that you're using or not using and how you can get involved with community programs and change can be initiated because of people's passion for our planet and nature and conserving so that's actually one of my favorite things is that real human aspect of it um and passion <laughs> how about you <laughs> no that's a really lovely answer <laughs> how about me i think along very similar veins I mean I am very much in public engagement and very much I'm an advocate for education um but I think if we're taking conservation as a whole like scope and view my favorite thing about it would be the hope that comes from it so it's a science it's an ethos it's the world around us that is constantly changing but also we haven't learn everything about it we're still arguing as to whether wildcats are all european wildcats or scottish <laughs> wildcats we're still arguing as to whether or not there's four species of giraffe or whether there's just one big species we're still learning so so much about these creatures that are around us and these habitats are around us every single day that you have to have hope when you work in conservation because yes it can sometimes get a little bit bleak and it can sometimes feel a little bit overwhelming when we watch all these documentaries and we have these conversations about how much damage has happened but then with change that is being instilled by individuals and with care that everybody has and with like small step by steps and even massive steps being made in science you there it's one of the fields that has so so much hope I can't I can't help but think that we're only moving forward in a better way even if it's not in a straight line upwards trajectory. 
I think that is amazing and I completely agree in that you have to be hopeful because yeah there is there is damage that you cannot shy away from that has been done to our planet by an immense human population but when you consider all of the amazing people that are working and some of our guests that you're going to hear from as well the things that people are doing and sharing their passions and working towards bit by bit little tiny stepping stone by stepping stone and sometimes big is going to make such a change and that's it it's kind of like you may be a drop in the ocean but you are a drop and that's really important because if there was no drops there's no ocean okay yeah so fundamentally I think Hannah and I wanted to start this podcast because you may hear it in our voices or you may notice how we ramble but we adore talking to each other and we adore conservation and we just want to share that a little bit more with the world and we don't know who our listeners are going to be. We imagine firstly it will be our parents and our friends and our and our loved ones. But hopefully that will grow. We have no idea who is going to be listening and what you're going to be listening for, whether it's to learn a little bit more or to try and get some hints and tips about how to get into the conservation world. We will help you if we can and we will answer any questions that you have. So I think sharing our socials would be a good thing to do. Yep, yeah, I think that's a great idea. Uh, you will find us on Twitter and you will also find us on our website. And those links are going to be in the bio of this episode that you're listening to. So make sure you do go and check that out. You'll see our logo, um, which was made for us by Sean Green Illustrations. And you can find them on Instagram at Sean Draws. Yeah, just keep an eye out. Everything's going to be changing in terms of our release schedule. So this, as we've said, is our pilot episode letting you know who we are, what our podcast is going to be. And we are going to be releasing weekly and that will be starting very shortly. So do come and follow us on our socials because we'll be posting our countdowns and you'll get a nice alert if you subscribe to this feed now. Go on, hit that subscribe button. Subscribe now and you will actually see when our first official episode gets posted. And we've got some real exciting guests yeah. coming up. I mean, not to humble brag, but you've already seen how many things we've done and how many people we've met by the amount of things, internships and unis and jobs that we've done. So we're slowly just asking all of our friends and acquaintances if they would care to come and chat to us. So we're really excited. So let's hope you're excited enough to subscribe. Yeah, that is exactly the case. And you can also contact us on our email. And again, that will be available in our show notes. But I think that's us pretty much wrapping up for our pilot episode. Thank you for joining us. And I hope you've enjoyed our rambling, our passion, our chat about conservation. And I'll say bye-bye. See you soon. Bye. Thank you for listening today. As always, we have been Wild About Conservation and you have been awesome. Please do leave us a review. We would really appreciate it and we do read them all. To keep exploring with us, drop us an email or find us on our socials. All the links are in our description and the show notes. If you enjoy our show and want to support us, we are also on Patreon. Just £1 a month, 25p an episode, will cover our creation costs. And anything above that, we donate to charity. Thank you to those of you that are already helping us to keep creating. Our chosen charity for this season are the British Divers Marine Life Rescue, who are an organisation dedicated to the rescue and well-being of all marine animals in distress around the UK. Donations will go to training teams of volunteers and maintaining specialised equipment that is vital for their work. Don't forget to look out for our next episode next Wednesday, wherever you get your podcasts. If we aren't there, do let us know. And remember, step outside and get wild about conservation. Bye! How do you get wild? Watching wildlife documentaries. Wildflower painting. Diving. Wild swimming. Ocean watching. Rock climbing. Bird watching. Listening to podcasts. Hill walks. Visiting a wildlife charity.